Hello, hello again, YouTubers. Uh, here we are in the den with the three philosophers. Vince and Keith are, are with me again. And we are now coming into the final chapter of Thankwall, The End Times. So uh, here we are, chapter seven, as I said. Chapter six saw us in Middenheim for the most part of it, where Archaon revealed his full might and building up for, for four books now, we finally get Archeon, and he slapped the Empire down and uh, took care of Middenheim in a matter of hours. Um, joining up with the Skaven at the end of that, the Skaven are all rallying around his banner. Um, but we're going to switch the arena of war once again back to the mountains where we're going to involve ourselves with Skaven and Dwarfs and revisit old friends like Ungram Iron Fist and Queek and Ikid Claw. Um, so I think to uh, to open this up, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass to Vince and, and let us know of what's happening in those peaks. Yes. So we pick up more or less right where we left off with Ungram, the Slayer King. And if we remember, there was uh, Ikid had a devilish little plan with involving three. Uh, hell pit abominations that had struggled their way forward toward the great door of Karak uh, Kadrin or Kadrin, I don't know how you say those words, but uh, and the first one got shot down. The second one and third one basically started beating the door open, and the second one kind of got in and started squidging its little rat form through when it got melted and died, and then it exploded. And when it exploded, out came the most vile and hideous poison gas that the Skaven had yet created. And uh, they say it, it was uh, it was so deadly that even at more than a mile away, half of Ungram's throng fell, twitching in agony, gasping out their last. That's some pretty virulent stuff. And Ungram basically retreats. He um, he realizes there's no return through that gate. And he kind of follows this trail, and they, they say that like some of the Skaven pick him out, and he gets in a bit of a running fight uh, where parts of his force are dwindling and dwindling and dwindling as he has to like leave behind rear guards and things like that. And uh, eventually, what he's got left, really just a war band, they get into the actual access tunnels, into the entrance, and down into the actual tunnels, and. Um, he gets himself to, so he's down to I think like 50 dwarves or something like that. Pretty much what's left is slayers, and uh, he gets down into the bar uh, Zundok Fortress Gate, and he sees a bunch of iron breakers standing shoulder to shoulder in a thin passageway, and he's expecting that it's you know this he knows has been assaulted, but like good dwarves, they're probably already he sees like that there were some repairs already underway, and as he approaches the iron breakers. They do not hail him. They do not acknowledge him because they are all dead. Their corpses were killed so suddenly and they stand so tight in their little heavy armor formation that when they drop dead, they didn't even fall over. Maybe it's just their stubbornness, but they remain sort of cold, lifeless, dwarven statues, testament to the virulent killing power of the Skaven. And, uh... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to slip in with a with a testament to how powerful that gas is. So they so they, they effectively are in their own little iron coffins, which I thought was kind of the imagery that I imagined here. They're gassed out and they couldn't get out of their armor, so there they died. Yep. And as Unger makes his way around the halls uh, of Karak Kedrin, uh, it's the same story repeated over and over. And basically the tale of what happens gets recreated from the corpses. The third hell pit had made its way all the way in and started basically just dropping these virulent poison gas bombs everywhere. It had been, It's dying from its own poison and, and gas because it's killing itself. And it drops dead. And then as hell pits are prone to do, it stands back up and keeps squidging its way down the tunnels, dropping more little bombs, more leaving its awful trail of poison mess behind it. And as it's going and seeking deeper into the heart of the stronghold, gas is flowing out into all these little tunnels everywhere and just suddenly 
you know, it's, uh, suddenly the clouds will come upon the, the watch wardens of the mountain and they die where they stand. And the hell pit dies and regenerates enough times to get five miles down into the, the mountain before dropping dead and finally not standing up again and belching out all the rest of its grotesque payload uh, into the mountainside. And uh, so basically for several days, Ungram walks in the, the, the basically tomb-like halls. The only thing, he and his men are the only thing still alive in the halls, really. And the, the entire mountain is now quite literally a giant tomb. And uh, they, on the day they're, they finally decide to leave, they stop by the shrine of, of Grimnir. Um, and so basically this is, you know, this shrine is a very sacred place for the slayers. It's kind of what you swear your slayer oath upon and touch and you know, it's, that kind of thing. It's a very important artifact to the, to the slayer cadre within the dwarven people. And um, as he touches it, the runes that are all in, in, in squirreled upon it uh, glow with a bright light and flow into him and his beard and his head and everything, you know, it's, all, it's just, of course shock red because he's a slayer, um, become uh, literal orange as they catch on fire. And we see he just belches out flames and cleanses all of the poison from uh, all of the halls as he just gouts forth fire everywhere uh, and leaves the place just an empty, uh, an empty hall. Uh, as Ungram becomes the incarnate of fire. Yeah, so this is uh, obviously ties in with the timing of the unraveling of the vortex back on Oathland from the previous book. And um, you remember here that Teclis tried to bind fire to Malekith. That was his original intent. But before he could really get control of that ritual, that was the first one to go, I think, if I remember right. So that was the first one to go, and obviously this is where it anchored itself. It was the second. I believe Beast was the first one because it was the wildest one. But yeah, then Fire went out. What was Beast? Okay. Alrighty. Well, there's more dwarf talk here, so we're kind of running out of dwarf holds. Uh, as are all being <laughs> run by, by Skaven. Um, remember earlier in the book, it was it was the Eight Peaks that was a big focus. But while that was going on, uh, Karak Varn... And uh, which is, is that the seafront one? No, no, Karak Varn is a different one. But also the seafront one, Barak Var, that all went down to Skaven pretty early. And, uh, and that was just a passing over. Uh, so we're not left with much. Keith, did, did the dwarfs got anything to hold on to here? Well, we, we shoot back to Karaz of Karak, and things are looking pretty grim there as well. I mean, it's, it's pretty much the last hole that's there, but it's the strongest, it was the first, and it's the home of the High King uh, Thorum Birchbear. Uh, but he's just suffered a huge defeat, and uh, when the chapter comes up on him, he's uh, just after this big battle in his throne room, and he kind of orders everyone out of the throne room. Um, now, he has been injured in this battle, uh, of course, because everyone and their mothers have one, a vermin lord was present, and it whacked him with his... Uh, with the war, with the warp wave or war wave, whatever it's called, and uh, cuts through his super great special armor that nobody knows how to make anymore, and there's a very grievous wound to him which will not heal. Um, so you know that's definitely an entry for the Book of Grudges. Um, so he orders everyone to get out of his chamber or get out of his throne room, and then he kind of like hobbles off his throne and goes to inspect Azamar, which is the Eternity Room um, located on his throne. Now, so we'll talk a little bit about this rune because it's pretty symbolic to the entire dwarf race. Uh, this rune was forged by the dwarf ancestor god Grunji himself, and it's described in the book as being um, Grunji did not give out praise at all. He was very hard to please, complete perfectionist. But when he forged this rune, he declared it satisfactory. Um, and with it kind of entwined the fate of the entire dwarf race. So as long as the rune was still intact and still glowing and all nice and warm, the dwarves would be okay. Um, and so far it was. But during the battle, Thorgrim had noticed something weird happened, that for a minute the world had sheen yellow, and that despite taking this horrible hit from the Vermin Lord, 
his armor seemed to have repaired itself. And this is armor sold that no one knows um, how to make it anymore, let's fix it. But it is repaired. Um, so Thorgrim is examining Azamar, and he feels a strange energy humming in it. And he kind of laments the fact that all of his team uh, rune lords have passed away. Uh, so Thoric Ironbrow, who's um, one of the more famous ones, he died very early on in the siege of his Karak. Um, so he simply doesn't know what's going on. Now, of course, from a reader's perspective, we can surmise that the, the wind of metal has um, lodged itself in this eternity room and has passed on some of its power onto Thorgrim um, by heating up his armor and that. Um, but at this point, uh, Queek Headtaker has decided to return and is going to take another crack at the dwarves. And it kind of goes on a bit about how Queek is best killing dwarves and it's what he does for a living. Um, and that Queek's plan was relatively straightforward. He was going to take this big battery of uh, cannons and just shoot down the front door and then just run right in and chop off Thorgrim's head. Because that's what he to do. Um, now, Thorgrim is simple. completely sent by this plan. Sorry? I said it seems pretty simple. Yeah, that's I mean, it, like, the least amount of moving parts, right? I mean, it, it can't break down. <laughs> um, so, Thorgrim kind of at the, you know, against the advice of the most sagely dwarves has decided, no, 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 we're going to open up all the ancient vaults, we're going to give everyone, like, the best hammer and the best axes and the best shields that we can't even make anymore. Magic's so good that you don't need to polish these things, they keep an edge, uh, everyone's going to get one, and we're going to march out, and we're just going to wreck these skating. Thorgrim is totally sick of sticking in his, um, sticking in his halls at this point. Um, which is kind of really different to the normal dwarf test, um, the normal dwarf, you know, mode of war. Queek gets there and he kind of thinks like, ah, you know, dwarves are pretty predictable, I know how to do this, they're going to stay there in their holds and they're going to grind and we're going to push them back and they're going to go to the next layer of defense and then we're going to push them back and they're going to go to the next layer of defense and basically what we saw at uh, Karak 8 piece. But Thorgrim says, nah, screw it, we're, we're just going for it, we're going, going big or going home. Um, so he sallies force out of the gates. Yeah, it really kind of really kind of flips the attitude of, of dwarfs. Um, I, I again, I remember back to the Nagash book where we're talking about the dwarfs and uh, and their sort of opening stages of, of the Nagash scale and when the end times are really rolling out. And of course, Thorgrim was one of those staunch guys who said, "No, we gotta we gotta hold it up. We gotta close the doors. Um, there's chaos everywhere. Everybody's got to deal with their own stuff." Uh, Thoric was one of the guys, and Ungrim was one of the other guys that wanted to sally out and help out the Empire, but Thorgrim never was. Um, so I guess now, at the last stages of desperation, um, finally coming around to take some action, he starts the dwarf. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to cut away here for uh, for a very momentous, uh, a very momentous cutscene, and this involves. Our, uh, our our favorite guys, Thanquall and, and, and Vermin King themselves, but, but even greater than that, um, clouds of shadow kind of kind of billow out around the two of them, and out of those shadows kind of manifests all of the Vermin Lords. So this Shadow Council that we touched on a couple of chapters ago is now having their little meeting, and our title guy, Thanquall, is part of it. Uh, a couple of the Vermin Lords sort of question what he's doing there, but Screech Vermin King defends his position, and, uh, and they go on with their little meeting. It's a very succinct one, um, but the point of it is, is that it has been decided by the Shadow Council, that they've all agreed, that whichever clan is responsible for taking the head of Thorgrim Grungebearer will get that vacant seat on the Council of Thirteen, and of course, Ska uh, Mr. Thankwall being there right there to listen to it is just giddy with glee and super excited about the prospect of it. But he's not involved in the battle itself. Um, so that's maybe a little bit of a concern for him. Uh, and then just at the last moment here, all the Vermin Lords kind of turn to one another, recognize that somebody's missing, 
And just as they say that, Lurklox manifests himself out of the shadows and reports just in time to report that the attack is underway. Scryer and Morse are, are bearing down on Karaza Karak, and the big throwdown's about to begin. Um, so, guys, any any thoughts about about this big momentous occasion? Or if not, we can go ahead into the action. It's a confirmation that the Shadow Council is truly a, a mirror of the uh, of the the normal council because there's only twelve of them. Right, there's always thirteen is the magic number, but there's always one seat that's never taken because that's the seat for the Horned Rat. That's right. true on the the normal Skaven Council, and it seems to be true here as well. Like even the Vermin Lords seem to reserve a position for the Horned Rat. So I thought that was interesting. Yep. What I what I think is interesting about this whole, I, I mean, I guess you could almost imagine the whole book is that. Um, so, um, oh, what's his face? Vermin King is doing everything he can, throwing his patency to Tranquil to try and get him back on the seat of the council because the Grey Seers have fallen out of favor. And what I think is interesting is why cannot like the Vermin Lords just turn up and kind of say, hey, he's on the council now. I'm the, you know, I'm the Avatar, the Speaker of the Horned Rat, and I say the Grey Seers get a seat back on the council. And that gives us a really good insight into Skaven ways of life doesn't operate like that. So they have to go through all of these machinations where, um, like, they have to set up Tranquil in order to take Null, and they're going to have to do these really weird, you know, political gymnastics in order to get the head of Thorgrim so that Tranquil can have it so that he can get him onto the council and blah, 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 blah. Um, which I thought was really, really interesting that, you know, this giant demigod demon can't just turn up and go, hey, this is what I want, and then the Skaven will jump to his tune. They have to engineer it, make, him, make them think it's their own idea almost. Mm -hmm. yeah, Skaven are the hardest edge, coldest meritocracy that has ever existed. Only <laughs> the worthy rise. Yeah. <laughs> or the ones who cheat the most. Yeah, well, that makes you worthy. That's just it. That's, it's, it's a, it is a meritocracy without ethic, right? Like, that's the, like anything you can do to get ahead justifies your position of being ahead. Yeah. All right, Vince. Okay, Vince, well, let's, uh, let's move on from, from there then and uh, get into the staging of the big old fight. Yes. So um, you know, Keith set up the attack plan very well. I think that's exactly right. I mean, he, he set the good stages. We've got Queek. He's here. He's here with Icket Claw. This is Moors and Skyre, so Moors is a lesser clan, but it's Queek's personal clan. And he's allied with Clan Skyer, which he's not thrilled about. He finds them kind of weak, but anything's better than Grey Seers in Queek's mind. He's classically despises Grey Seers and thinks that they're just... He, he's a warrior. He likes warriors. Skyer uses magic, but at least they're weird techno people. You know, he can wrap his brain more around that. Um, and he's got a pretty straightforward plan, as, as Keith said. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the dwarves surprise him a little bit. And by rolling out, and uh, they roll out to meet him. And unfortunately, uh, at the same time, the dwarves also, I picture like their entire mountain having these slide away walls that just like cannons push out of. <laughs> and it's just like, me, 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 me. This entire battle mountain comes online. And the Skaven, even though they have, uh, even though they have quite a, uh, uh, quite a large amount of sort of artillery. And you might say, well, what does that mean, Vince? What did they bring to this battle when you say a large amount of artillery? Okay. Well, Clan Skyer has 32 Warlock Engineers, 13 Claws of Poison Wind Globideers, 132 Warp Lightning Batteries. 132. <laughs> Two lightning cannons is a problem in most games. 132. This is a big battle. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. That's that's 13 dozen, just to yes. uh, just to put a good number to it. There you go. I'd, probably not uh, not accidental there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, it's not 13 dozen. You should have 169. I just want it to be 13 dozen because it would be a good number. <laughs> gotcha. Well, it's probably 13 something, but whatever. Um, so we have the setup for this battle as, as they come out. Now, I will point out, I have said before, I'm not trying to spoil anything, we'll already get to this anyways, but as we have mentioned many times, when you get these 
battle setup pages where it lists off the characters and things like that. Uh, I will point out that when I, you look at the dwarves and then you look at the uh, the Clan Moors and Skyer Claw Pact and you do the special character comparison, hmm, the dwarves do come out just a little bit ahead where you've got Thorgrim, Ungrim, Bugman, you know, it's like, and then Bugman's Rangers, the Everguard, which is a personal uh, uh, guard of the king. Uh, it's pretty good. And then you go to the Skaven, and it doesn't even mention Ickit and Queek on the page. It just mentions, like, their their people and some other no-names. So that's fun. But at any it rate... It does mention the Doomwheel Brigade, though. That's pretty fun. It does, and I like that. I want to look into yeah. how do I buy that as a unit. I want more, more Doomwheels. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, basically, uh, Thorgrim rides out and starts, like, literally just shouting from the Book of Grudges, right? He's just reading it off. He reads the names of the other Fallen Holds, and he just, like, he's going on this tirade of reading off Grudges. And what's, what I find interesting, I, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Dwarves, I've said this before, but I do like this little moment. When he finishes it, there's not, silence is the response. The dwarves don't cheer or yell or battle cry. They fall silent at the end of the reading of the grudges because that is all the time for voices. Now is the time for axes to do the speaking. And I like that imagery. I like that the dwarves, that's how they like steal themselves for battle by just falling silent. And med I, I, th I picture them like thinking deeply upon the grudge and tightening the grip on their axe and being ready to take, you know, the due recompense for that grudge. Um, and so, uh, basically, as I said, Battle Mountain goes into effect and cannons and everything else that the dwarves have, which are very long range, begin sounding off. And the dwarves basically counter battery down the scavens. The first, the, the first thing they do is sort of obliterate all the the uh, slaves that are out in front of the army in the killing field. And then once those are kind of pushed back and wiped out and, and weakened, they start counter-battering the enemy artillery um, and wiping out uh, Queek's own artillery. Um, Queek has a host of artillery, as I mentioned, but uh, even as they say, it's not enough to take on an entire mountain of artillery, like the strongest mountain of artillery in the world. Yeah, it's pretty menacing. <laughs> it's wasn't there some kind of GI Joe battle mountain eh, from the cartoons <laughs> of old? I think so. Yeah, I think you could buy like That's a toy. To and I thought of yeah. that. Um, so basically, Queek sees all this and says, "Okay, no problem. This is fine. Let him shoot slaves. Let him shoot my artillery. I don't care." I'm gonna win this the same way I've always won this. The dwarves are marching out. He sort of adjusts his battle plan. And uh, he says, basically, we're going to let them walk toward us. Eventually, they'll walk out of the covering range of the most of their heavy artillery, like their organ guns. And that's where we'll meet them, surround them, overwhelm them. I'll kill Thorgrim. Thumbs up. Good to go. Like, that's sort of, you know, piece of cake. Um, and they sort of come for it. It happens exactly as he predicts it to go down. And we get Ickit Claw, who uh, leads the countercharge himself, old Mr. Claw, in his, uh, in his power armor suit. And, uh, you know, the dwarves are certainly more than a match as they start hacking through his troops using their uh, magic weapons and such. Unfortunately, their magic weapons are not enough to stop Ickit Claw, who starts just, he has a little warp flame cannon in his arm because he's wearing a Terminator suit. And uh, he starts just melting them and shouting off, shooting off Warp Lightning. And then, unfortunately, he runs afoul of the Drake Wardens, um, who are their, um, what are they called, Iron Drakes, right? Is that, that's the name of the unit? Yeah, they got their fire-forged armor that is super resistant to, to flaming attacks. Yes. And they, being completely resistant to these gouts of Warp Flame, are coming forward, and Ickit's like, well, crap, I'm going to die and uh, sees his sort of doom descending upon him in the form of these insane, steel-clad, fireproof dwarves, when, uh, unfortunately for the dwarves, in comes the Doomwheel Brigade. Da -da -da -da. From the side, in comes the Doomwheel Brigade, just cracking off warp lightning and impact hitting, and they ride in, and they sort of uh, 
they sort of snatch up um, Ickit and kind of save him, and he manages to kind of get himself clear of that thanks to the intercession of uh, the, the Doom Wheel Brigade, which I particularly like. Fireproof, yes. Lightning proof, not so much. Let's remember that Ickit took a little bit of flame blast in return from those Iron Drake guns as well. Yes. He got a little bit of his own medicine in return before he was able to scurry away. That's a, that's a good point. That comes up later in a nice little uh, in a nice little scene. So yeah, that's a very good point. He did get he got some he got scorched just a little before he got out of there. That's right. Okay. Well, so uh, so do you do you want to carry on with the uh, with the big showdown scene? Maybe I'll interject a little bit and I'll and I'll pick up some some dwarf activity. Yeah, absolutely. So after the Doom Wheels come in and, and we have a little bit of a little bit of a sway back to the Skaven favor at that point, and they're starting to take a foothold. Um, Queek then starts to move in with his claw packs as well, and he's bringing on the uh, he is bringing on the red the red host of of Plan Moors with his elite storm vermin, and uh, his job is to is to pin down Thorgrim, of course, and, and make his way to that. But just as they are making headway and it's looking good for the Skaven, a little bit of rescue comes in. And that is in the form of two heroes from the previous battle. Ungrim shows up with the remaining, um, with his remaining slayers that managed to escape from uh, Karak Kadrin, and they show up. But also traveling with them is Joseph Bugman and his rangers, who, if we remember back, uh, they came and showed up on the doorstep of that Karak um, when it was in trouble as well. So these guys are Joseph Bugman is sort of like the the eleventh hour rescue brigade of the dwarfs, who just kind of appears out of the out of the hillside at the hour of most need. Um, but with those two guys' appearances, and especially Ungram, uh, now that he is imbued with all this firepower and he is the incarnate of of the wind of Vakshi, starts coming in and just burninating Skaven all over the place and sizzling mangy furs and uh, sending them scurrying. And Queek, who is in the thick of it at this point, sees the lines crumbling, and he obviously gets the sense that things are turning against him, which they are. Um, so he puts it upon himself that he can't wait any longer. There's no, there's no more patience. He's going to make the pitch at getting right to Thorgrim, and here's the time. It's time to lop that guy's head off. Um, if I and, uh, interject for a sec there, yeah, you I go. think you should take this fight. This is you too can, sad for me to recount this fight. You can take the cinema from there. All Do right, it. all right, okay. Well, I, I, just something interesting to point out is that um, so Creek's kind of mission is to take off Thorgrim's head because we know that whoever, whatever Skaven has Thorgrim's head, uh, gets beyond the uh, Council of Thirteen. However, it does allude to the fact that Creek isn't actually going to keep his head. So Queek doesn't want to, or whatever machinations are controlling him, isn't going to get onto Council of 13. Because it, it kind of mentions that he would, he couldn't wait to put the High King's head on his head rack, even if it was only for a little bit of time. And then he'd have to pass it on to whoever set that up. And you imagine that because he's he's in league with Lurklox, and Lurklox made that last appearance at the Shadow Council and said that the uh, attack is underway, that Lure Fox is almost subservient to Vermin King, and that everything has just been set up for Thankful. Everyone's just propping up Thankful to get back on that council for whatever reason. And I think this is kind of it's, it's kind of ironic and kind of hilarious because if, if that is the way it is, then Creek is effectively trying to get the Graciers, who he hates oh so so much, back on the council, um, which I thought was was an interesting roundabout way of getting things. But that's all things Steven, I suppose. Um, but back to the fight. Or do you guys want to say anything about that? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip in one extra thing there before you tell us what happens between Queek and Thorgrim. And that Queek. is that there's another assassin in the midst of, of Queek's retinue, actually. He is named the Black Mask. Mm -hmm. um, hired by... Trying to fight by Ickit Claw. And instructed to say that if Queek lops off Thorgrim's head, then you need to stab Queek in the back and take that head. So that's also in the works here as well, in the endless realms of backstabbing of the Skaven. 
you had to know that the naked claw wasn't going in there without a little bit of a backup plan. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, so it could set himself up for, for a place on the council, I reckon. Yep, you betcha. He's still bitter that he didn't get the, the job of making the big moon blasty cannon. Yeah, that's right. Right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so back uh, to the back to the action keys. Sure. Yeah, so, um, I mean, this fight is pretty short and sweet. Queek jumps in, he's got his trusty dwarf gouger, and he's going to try and gouge Thorgrim. And Thorgrim raises his magic axe to block him, and then just shatters dwarf gouger completely. Um, then with his free hand, he just grabs Queek by the neck, uh, or by the throat, and starts, starts squeezing and squeezing, and Queek's kind of flailing around and doing the best he can to try and break this hole. And eventually Thorgrim just snaps his neck and throws him on the ground. Then for good measure, takes his iron shod boot and rams it down, and it describes in quite a lot of detail the cracking and squishy noises that he made. And then uh, just to top it all off, he spits on him in the end. Um, but at this point then, the black mask makes himself revealed, and he jumps right behind, uh, or he jumps into Thorgrim's back, and Thorgrim, in a very you know, heroic, movie epic pose just doesn't really bat an eyelid, just turns around and splits him straight up the middle, uh, much like how Archeon split Vulcan earlier, or split um, Axel um, earlier on. And yeah, that was about it. So at this point, the Skaven are a complete full retreat, uh, as they want to do, and it's a, it's a victory for the dwarves. Um, and it's at this point, though, that Thorgrim, he's returning back to his throne, and his guard are cheering him on. And he looks down and he notices that the Rune of Eternity is cracked right up the middle. And he kind of ponders on what that might mean, but it doesn't go into anything uh, further there. But we can kind of surmise that things don't look good for the dwarves if the Rune of Eternity is cracked. Yeah, if we jump back to the start of the chapter where he iterates that as long as that rune still exists, then so will the dwarf hold. Yeah. Um, so or read, read that symbolism into the symbol that is the symbol of right. returning on the symbolic throne. Do you want to tell us what happened to Ikit here? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's just a little kind of a comical sidebar, I suppose, about Ikit Claw. Um, so this is after the Skaven have made their way back into the tunnels and put their tails between their legs and scurried away. Um, Ikit Claw has his has armor that he's encased in, and he faced a lot of flamey flameness while he was out there on the surface. So he's kind of cooked a few of these armor plates to his flesh, and he's getting his engineer lackeys to try to peel it away, but they're not doing a very gentle job of it. So every single time one of these engineers gives him a little bit of discomfort, he just kind of unceremoniously sizzles that guy to a to a crispy morsel and he goes through a half a dozen of this and then stares around his room at the other half dozen saying which of you fools is going to get this off me and they all just kind of shrink away and uh, and the callousness of a, of a scaven he just sizzles them all um, well and then uh, and then he kind of just laments the fact that it's another failure um, and he wasn't able to get the Dwarf King's head. He laments the failure of Queek that he wasn't able to get the Dwarf King's head. And uh, and he's just all bitter and upset about that. And knowing and recognizing that his seat on the council has slipped away from his grasp. And with that, he sizzles a few more engineers and you know carries on with his day. That's right. Yeah. But at the conclusion of all the fighting then, this is kind of normally where you would expect a chapter to wrap up, but there is a, a very exciting event that happens here at the end, and, and I think it's only fair that at the tail end of this whole Thankwall book that we give it to our, our most staunch Skaven supporter in Vince. It's all yours here. Take it away. Absolutely. So... We pick up actually with Thankwell, who is then sort of given a vision through Vermin King's scrying orb. He sort of produces it, and he says, you know, look deeply. 
And Thanquil says, what am I supposed to see? And Vermin King says, Doom. And he looks in, and he sees a dwarf. And that's when we cut to the sort of scene. We, you can almost picture the movie where we go into the orb and actually become, and we're now at the scene. And what we see is, is Thorgrim Grudgebearer, and he's tired. He's so tired because he's fought all these battles. He's been deeply wounded. And he's marching up these stairs to the very tip top of this peak of, uh, of the mountain. And it's this sort of secret route that had been revealed to him by, um, uh, by you know the the old by by another old dwarf, and it's it is sort of this king's perch, and there are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of steps to march up around this mountain, and the king is really feeling it. He's old now. He's separated from his throne, which obviously empowers him to some degree. He's separated from his his bearers and his guard. But he does this after every battle. They mention this, that after every battle, he comes here alone. And upon every step that he takes, he recounts the name of a dwarf that had fallen during the battle. He says their name and remembers their deeds and sort of puts their grudge, the grudge of their death, into his mind and pays them the due that they're necessary for their sacrifice for the dwarven people. So it's a re I really like the image. Like it's a very cool image of him doing one first step. And I think the point that drives it home is is he's even even though there are so many steps, he always runs out of steps before he runs out of names. And this battle is no different, certainly. And he gets to the top, and he looks out. He opens this sort of rune mark door, and he, he gets out, and he's he's basically at the top of the world. Like this is the tallest peak, and he is at the tallest point of it. These icy winds are blowing around, and he's casting his eyes out over the world. And he's kind of thinking about, you know, everything that happened. He's thinking about Ungram, and he's thinking about the dwarves that died, and, you know, just sort of ruminating, being alone with his thoughts. And unfortunately for him, uh, somebody was up here waiting. How long that person was waiting? I don't know. But my guess is a while. And detaching himself from the shadows and sliding down, silent and imperceptible, is our little friend right here. Oop, there you go. There he is. Deathmaster Snitch. Second in command of Clan Eshin. And the most brutal and efficient assassin that we know about in the old world. And I'll take him against that dumb wizard man from the previous chapter. Any day of the week. Better than Oxygen? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. That that in that fight, that is a dead lizard man. Can he uh, do texture? That's all I want to know. What's that? Can he what? <laughs> Can he do texture? Can he turn his skin into the thing that he's on? Uh, he doesn't need to. He is so sneaky that is unnecessary. So we'll that's a no then, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, Deathmaster Snitch, the greatest... I, I would just point to a page here. It had taken Deathmaster Snitch, hyphen, greatest of all assassins, hyphen... There is no comma on that. There's no of the Skaven race or anything. The book told you. And uh, he jumps down. And, of course, um, his he always has, uh, of course, warp, uh, forged weapons. But now each of them has been reinforced with blessings from uh, Lurklox, the vermin lord of Clan Eshin, who has been backing sort of Snidget the whole time here, as you pointed out earlier, Keith. And he drops down with these super vermin lord empowered blades. He has three of them, of course, one in each hand and one in his tail. He is an adept tail fighter. And all at once, bam, 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 three tails uh, stab into, or sorry, three blades stab into Thorgrim. And Thorgrim looks down and sees the point, the points of this trifecta of blades piercing his chest. And his last thought as the blood and the life essence drains from his body is to turn around and look at the door he left open. This secret door right into the heart of, uh, of the mountain is now standing wide open as Deathmaster Snitch is there. And so falls the last great king of the dwarves, killed by the greatest of assassins. And... Uh, Thankful, we then zoom back out to Thankful, who is just like 
super excited. He's like a kid who just was told he's going to get a bunch of candy. And basically, Vermin King says, that head will come to you. Uh, and you will be, you know, the the basically our our man on the council. You're going to make the Grey Seers retake their rightful place. And, um, you know, Snitch will go in that open door. He'll call up some gutter. He'll let some gutter runners in. The gutter runners will start opening other doors. And before the dwarves know it, basically they're just going to be infested. And without their king, it's it's now just a matter of time. They will be dead. And Vermin King kind of does a nice recounting of the deeds. He says, you know, basically Thankful says, so we've won, right? And Vermin King says, we've won much, but not all. Um, he basically points out that, like, the Lizard Kings, the Lizard Things are dead, but clan and Clan Pestilence is broken. Uh, and Vermilanx is not happy about that. Like, the Vermin Lord of Clan Pestilence is very displeased about the outcome of that little situation since someone dropped a comet on his head, basically. Or a moon, really. Someone dropped a moon on him, and he's displeased. Um, also here, we get a nice mention um, of Lord Skrulk, and basically, Vermin King says, don't forget Lord Skrulk, who will also be coming after you. So we get kind of a confirmation that Skrulk did survive the, uh, the... I don't know, whatever, the, the meteor shower, I guess. Um, yeah. he, got, he got knitted back together, and then the, and then the Vermin Lord kind of kind of teleported out, or, or nightcrawlered out, or whatever. Yep. And basically, he says, you know, Skyre has been humbled, but they're going to come back more, more dangerous. And he also gives this nice little illusion that more goes on behind Clan Mulder's doors than you know, pointing to, like, that there's some darkness there. And basically, he says... We've got these new allies in, in chaos, and they are very powerful. And, you know, basically, we don't need to tell you to be careful. But what we're doing here is biding our time, because the children of the horned rat shall inherit. And so he kind of confirms that basically, like, look, be careful. Don't, don't even, you know, give chaos an inch, because they will take a foot. And be ready, because one day we're going we're gonna to take what's ours. Yeah, so some big momentous words. Keith, do you have any, do you have any thoughts about, are you impressed by, by the Deathmaster here? Uh, I mean, he climbed the wall and he stabbed the guy in the back. How impressed can you be by that? <laughs> like. All right, I see. You're not going <laughs> to give it up that easily. I mean, it was all right, but... He didn't. He didn't have the texture of that wall. He didn't see into the infrared spectrum. He didn't spend He's also in the war. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, he also did something in the battle besides kill a nameless other assassin who wouldn't have succeeded at killing the most powerful sorcerer in the world, anyways. Like if that scape had even got there, Mazda Mundi would have just like put up some shield and then pulled the guy apart with telekinesis or something. Now, here's the thing. Oxyotl did so much, but he's such a good assassin, you don't even know about it. How <laughs> bad is Snitch that it's written down? We all, if, if he's the greatest assassin in the world and everyone knows it, then he's a terrible assassin. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that counterpoint, let's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that that brings us to the end of of Thankwall, but let's let's sum up a couple things here. So we have seen cities go down. We have seen dwarven holds crumble. We have seen vermin lords vermin lords spring up all across to to every skaven that uh, that put it on their wish list. Uh, we have seen empire cities get crushed. We have seen Archaon show his true might. Uh, for the first time, and we have seen pretty much an entire dwarf civilization um, be ruined by the overrunning of rats. So, thinking back upon a lot of things that went on in this book here, um, maybe Keith will we'll open up with you, and I want to ask you, what's your moment of brilliance out of this story? Hmm, moment of brilliance. Um... I, I think that just, what impressed you? Just, just the the giant plans the Skaven go for. Like it's quite impressive when they just kind of decide, now we'll blow up the moon. We'll just that it has stuff that we want, so we'll just blow it up. We were gonna pull it closer, but now we're just gonna blow it up. And 
Um, I think that like just that's the most appealing thing about that race that their ambitions are limitless. Like they really do, there's nothing that they can't do. At least that's what they think. I mean, they drilled a giant hole into Null and was just like, no, 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 we're not gonna we're not gonna just steal the munitions. We'll just steal the entire district the munitions are held in, and then we'll figure it out in our own time. Like it's pretty impressive. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And how, and how are you? Oh. Um, well, I will. I will actually say that since Keith gave a point to my side for that, it's funny because before he even said that, I was going to actually give the brilliance moment to the Lizardmen in that I love watching. I, I do honestly love the way that they describe Mazda Mundi working throughout this book. Um, you really do get the sense that he is like a sorcerer, nearly without equal. Right, the way that he's able to utilize these sort of ancient magics of his people and and. He, you know, when a lot of times when we see spellcasters, they're doing really powerful things, but it's sort of close up, right? They're like blasting away a unit of troops or calling down, you know, various fires and lightnings and stuff. And it's all impressive and potent and powerful. But with Mazda Mundi, the sense you get of him and the actions he takes is it's bigger. He's like affecting a continent. He's shielding reality. He's steering aside, you know, explosions and, and stopping, you know, these horrendous events. He's calming tidal waves. I think back to like, I, th I think back to not, you know, not in this book, but I remember there was a, a story from way back in the Lizardmen where the Lizardmen wanted to get to the old world. And so Aslan just marched up to the edge of the ocean and parted the ocean like Red Sea style, but not, not the Red Sea, the ocean, and then marched his force across it all the way to the old world. And I just think it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. It, it proves just their magical power. It doesn't always have to be the bigger explosion. I think they do a good job of showing that he kind of has these these constant efforts. This He's a super mage. I think that's cool. Yep, can't disagree with those two, two strong points. And certainly you get the idea that that's the most momentous things that, that go on as the theme for this for this whole book. And those Lizardman versus Skaven chapters were probably... The, the best of them all um, as far as great ventures. Um, so let's uh, let's look at it from the other angle though. Uh, so we're gonna throw it back to you Keith here to think about what's your what, what's your balderdash moment from from this tale of Thankwell? I think it's gotta be Codbringer running off into the woods to fight one eye. Like as funny as it is, it's just it's just <laughs> like like in terms of like in the context of a novel, it's five pages of just this total side story which doesn't advance the fluff at all and kills one special character on one guy who's not really a dude. Like, you barely know anything about the Todd Ringer. But it's entertaining, right? Um, the other, one other Boulder Dash moment is, why is Gregor Martak not turning into a great mountain chimera? Just in general, why is that not a thing? He could <laughs> kill Archeon. Yeah. Those things are amazing. Well, I think it's because he was imbued with the power of Ulrich, not the power of Kadon, which he probably... Um, that would have been yeah, better. No man can for him, I suppose. That would have been better. All right. How about your view on that, Vince? Um, for the Skaven named book, the Skaven spend this entire book losing. This is <laughs> a, like... It, it, it is... Nagash wins at the end of Nagash, right? The Glot can, I mean, basically achieve their ends at the end of Glocken. Yes, they get beat, but I mean only just. And they spend the whole book winning until at the zero hour, you know, lightning uh, Carl Franz comes down and basically banishes them. And even then, as, as we saw at the beginning of this book, or uh, sorry, at the beginning of this chapter with the Empire, they achieved their ends. You know, like, Aldorf was untenable. The, the capital of man had fallen. Um... You know, Cain certainly wasn't about Cain. Cain didn't achieve what he was going for. But Tyrion is pretty successful in that book. And in the end, the elves, I think, came out of it maybe even in a like in a completely different position. It was a sort of different story, right? Um, but Thankful and the Skaven spend this book losing. They don't really win. I mean, you get that one moment at the end where Snitch pulls it back. And yes, they destroy all the Lizardmen at the cost of one of their clans and an entire continent and basically the ruination of act their their actual long-term success because they just truly empower chaos and they are forced to bend the knee. Like, at every turn, they're either not actually even in this book because you don't, like, 
there are whole chapters where, like, for instance, the Midnight chapter, where they're not even really in it at all. Like, they're not a focus in that. That's our, that's that's Archaon chapter zero, right? The, you know, the Skaven are just there, sort of, and it happens. <laughs> um, so I, I think for the Skaven-themed book, it's not really that great for the Skaven. They lose a whole clan, basically don't achieve their ends, and become part of Chaos, but they get to kill a Dwarf King, so which is cool. I like that. I'm down with that. They had a good time in Nolm. That went their way. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah there you go. Nolm was the one good bright point, yes. I get you. If I could bring up a counterpoint to that, I don't think Skaven ever... You can't ever say Skaven wins, because Skaven are perpetually infighting. So I think you kind of have to go to the subgroups and kind of say, well, who out of the Skaven won? And I think Fankwold certainly came out ahead on that one. Uh, Clan Moors and Clan Scryers seem to be doing okay. And if you look at the overall motivations of what they want to achieve, like, they did destroy the moon, so they've got all their warp stone, which is really, really good. Um, in the second Lizardman chapter, there's this bit where Skrulk and uh, Vermilanx is visited by Thankwell and Vermin King, and all Skrulk is supposed to do all of that invasion of Lustra was just to stop or distract the slime from interfering with the ritual in Skaven Blight. Now, you can interpret that being the ritual was the blowing up of the moon, or it could be something else. Because um, it doesn't seem like the slime would have been able to stop that. So, to that end, the Skaven won. The Skaven stopped the slime from interfering with whatever. Um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. I mean, yes, you could see they lost a lot of battles, but did they win the war? And which one of them, which, you know, which one, which individuals win, won the war, I think, is a better. Yeah. And they're also at the, at the end of it all, they're, they seem to be on the, on the winning side, if not mm -hmm. if they themselves aren't the winners. Certainly getting in camp with Archeon, um, with the state of the world right now, seems to be the right side of that fence to be on. Yeah. I certainly well, agree with that. that? What do you think, Karen? What's your brilliant moment and your balderdash moment? Well, I think my uh, my my moments of brilliance are are both in parcel with the with the ones that you guys mentioned. Um, most of all was the uh, the devising that they did in Nome to bring down that whole district. I think that is that is absolute brilliance. Um, blowing up the moon aside. I mean, sure, that's a that's a big deal, and and the known part was was a step towards that end, and and that's absolutely momentous. But but I think that maybe we didn't spend enough time talking about the brilliance of making all those little all those little gadgets that would drill down into the ground and be placed by gutter runners in the first place, and then set it all off so that they could essentially pull the floor out from a whole you know a couple mile district of the whole city. And drop it down on there. So that's the that's the tricksy business that I'm most impressed with by this Caven, and I thought was the coolest moment in this book. You know, can I just say something on that real quick? Yeah. Um, it shows the power of what happens when the clan. This book shows the power of what happens when the clans work together, and mm -hmm. I think very much the rest of the clans wanted to get rid of Pestilence because they're the clan that doesn't work with the rest of them. Skyer and Mulder get together and make Storm Beans, right? Skyer and Eshin get together and they're able to plant these bombs, right? Like, the other three clans all have synergy. But Pestilence shows up and everybody just gets sick. <laughs> like, nobody, they're the odd <laughs> man out. And I think the other clans were like, send these guys to Lustria and we'll pull, throw the moon on them. Let's just get rid of you. These guys are dragging us down. So I, I really <laughs> think, like, somewhere in the Vermin Lord's plan was the idea of, like, get rid of those guys and we got a real shot at this. They, they never say that, but I get that impression. That Nobody likes the smelly kid. Yeah, exactly. Don't be the smelly kid. <laughs> yeah. Or like the beast of Nurgle, hey? Like the beast of Nurgle just wants to play with you, but it doesn't go well. Not right. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, on the flip side of that, though, my, my balderdash moment was, I'm going to say the sequencing of this whole story. Like we did a lot of jumping around from one realm to another realm, but we also did a lot of jumping around in the timeline of things too. Like we were we were backpedaling at times um, to, to cover as, as much as a year and a half in the past. And I think unless you really kind of go back and, and study that and look at it as a whole, 
and overlap that with the storyline of the other books, it, it really is a little bit bizarre. Um, if I was to do this again, I might, I might just uh, do the, the the whole Lizard Man bit together if I had to. I mean, it doesn't match up with the timeline, but why not pile that all in together? Um, get the dwarf action all in together, and and I also think that most of all, tuck in a dwarf chapter at the end of this after you've just come to the huge, momentous introduction of Archeon. Um, almost seems like a conclusion after the conclusion. That's an empty conclusion. Um, yeah. And I'm going to hack on Lord of the Rings here for a second and say it's like after you've dropped the ring in Mount Doom, why is it important that you send some hobbits across the water from the Grey Havens? You know, a little bit like that. Yeah, that, that last chapter, is for as short as it is, is two years. It starts in winter 25-25, which I think is when the stuff is happening with Ungram. And it doesn't end until autumn, so basically right before winter 25, 27. That's like, how long was Ungram marching? What was he doing for two years? I mean, that's you know, there's like, there's a wide berth of time in there. Huh. Yeah, and, and again, that's one of those jumping back in time things from the prior chapter. The prior chapter um, is very short. It's just the summer to autumn of 25, 27. So it's happening at the same time that. Uh, the Thorgrim's getting his head lopped off, right? Yep. Mm. Most of that. So anyway, um, final thoughts here, gents. We've come to the end of number four out of the end times here with Thankwall and his team. It's been, a, it's been a good roll so far. We've got, Absolutely. Uh, the, Lots of fun. The to come. Yeah, I think it's been really nice going from Glockin, which I felt was a pretty lighthearted book, because all the nerdy stuff was kind of fun, and then Kane was pretty serious, and then this, I think, had interjections of, because I think I get a real kind of strong, like, Calvin and Hobbes vibe from Vermin King and Sanquil. They're kind of wandering around the world together, like, getting up in mischief. And, you know, I think I think this gave and provide a little bit of comic relief every now and again from the really heavy stuff of, you know, giant racial genocide and things like that. So... Yeah, it's been a good, been a good read. Good. Well, I think with that, to our viewers, I'll say uh, we'll say good night. Thanks for thanks for listening in thus far. Um, I think this is probably our 17th or 18th episode of End Times, and uh, we got a volume of Archeon to go. So stick with us all the way. We'll take you right to the end. Good night to everyone. Night. Have a good one. Then we have Wang, yes, yes, asked Thanquo. The Vermin King shook his head, his majestic horns swaying. We have won much, but not all. The lizard things in their lands are dead gone, but Clan Pestilence is broken. We sense Vermilanx's fury. Don't forget Skrulk, or the Seventh Plague Lord for he is hidden amongst the Under Empire, hidden even from our eyes. Clan Scryer has been humbled, but will return even more dangerous. And more goes on behind Clan Mulder's doors than you know. Screech looked down upon the Grey Seer, his enormous claw hand patting the thankful like a pet. And our new allies, the ever-chosen Chaos, they are most powerful of all, yes, yes. We need must not tell you. Yet we, you and us, said the vermin lord, his myriad features shifting minutely. Will we will bide our time. One day it will all be ours. The children of the horn rat shall inherit.